biggest thing for those of you taking the LSAT Flex anytime in the foreseeable future. If you already have the same device that you'll be using for test day, you can actually test out your system early beforehand to get any potential issues addressed. There's actually a website on ProctorU's site, a subdomain there, where you can test out your system. And you could test it out just on your own, but you could even test it out and connect with a live rep and chat with them, and they can take over your computer to adjust the settings appropriately. It's at testitout.proctoru.com, test it out with hyphens. I've put the link in the chat here. Those taking the June LSAT, check that out now. If you're taking July, you could also check it out now. It's available 24 seven. You can go on there, meet with a proctor and they will, or tech support person, and they will adjust your computer settings so that on test day, you are ready to go. And this is one of those little known things that top scorers do. They are obsessive about noticing all the little details that could derail you on test day. And they plan for those, getting those taken care of beforehand. And I'm getting ahead of myself. I will get into those 10 little known ways, but this one was especially timely given LSAT flex. I thought I would get into that a little bit. A couple other questions I get a lot related to LSAT flex are cheating and scoring and is it harder or is it easier? So I'll knock those out quickly then we'll get into the meat of the session tonight. So LSAT flex cheating, is it possible? I'd say not really. They're monitoring you with a webcam and a microphone. They're recording everything for later. They're even tracking your eye movements with AI. And so anything suspicious, they flag it, they can look at it later. Yes, there have been a number of cheating attempts over the years with ProctorU for other exams they administered. Like one person used, tried to use a drone to record the screen and capture exam questions because a lot of these exams, the, the exam questions get reused and reused for future tests. So if you could record those questions, maybe you could get an advantage for the future or someone else, you could sell them, sell them those questions and give them an advantage. But ProctorU is on top of all of this and they're looking to spot little things like this. Somebody else put post-it notes on their dog to try and have the dog walk around and they could look at little things that were written on there. I don't know how useful that is for the LSAT in particular, since this is not an exam of memorization, but people get creative. The worst one though, and this is really the stupidest one of all, is some people would cheat and then afterwards they would type with, over their, with their friend over something like Gchat or AIM back in the day, and they would tell, talk all about how they cheated, but didn't realize that Proctor you still ha had access to their computer even after the exam session had just closed, we're still sharing the screen. I could see everything that the person had inadvertently confessed to while we're chatting with their friends. So don't do anything dumb. And especially if you do, don't be even dumber afterwards and do something like that to get caught. It's really not worth it. I got an unrelated question earlier today from a student who was asking about academic dishonesty and how admissions looks at it. And the truth is they take it extremely seriously. They would probably take an offense related to underage drinking much less, much less seriously than academic dishonesty. Academic dishonesty is much more important to them because when you are a lawyer, you are admitted to the bar, you are an officer of the court, and ethical issues are to be taken extremely seriously. And so anything related to academic dishonesty, whether it's plagiarism on a paper in college or cheating on an exam, they take that extremely seriously. And it would definitely raise some concerns for them about what might you do in law school if you're feeling stressed out what might you do as an attorney? So that would certainly warrant an addendum, but it could be a deal breaker for some schools depending on the issue. And so especially, of course, for the LSAT, it's incredibly important. You don't want to be disqualified before you even set foot in the law school. Now, as for whether the LSAT flex is harder or easier, obviously, if you're taking June, you know you've got a flex. July is highly likely to be a flex, although they have not announced it yet. If you are not yet registered for a test date, and you think you could be ready by mid to late July, you might want to register for the July LSAT now. The deadline's actually on May 28th, just a few days away, and it will likely be rescheduled as a flex. So it's scheduled for July 13th now. It will likely be rescheduled as a flex a week or two later. The June LSAT was rescheduled a week, a week later. So something to consider if you think you'll be ready in time. But if you're not sure if you'll be ready in time or you think it's not that likely, I would hold off and go for August or later instead, especially August is quite likely to be a flex as well, maybe less than June, maybe less than July, but who knows. But the August LSAT currently scheduled for August 29th, if that is rescheduled as a flex, 
it may be again a week later, which would give you a good couple months to prepare for the LSAT and take it. And if you've been doing a few months already, that could work well. So I'll get into more specifics later, if you all would like me to. In the meantime, though, I will share a link to an LSAT Flex FAQ I am frequently updating. And I will also share a link to an LSAT Flex calculator that lets you estimate your scores taking only three sections rather than four section exams. Because the LSAT Flex, of course, it's three sections back to back and you're done, not four scored sections plus one experimental like it is on the regular LSAT. So I'm happy to take any questions you'll have about the Flex or anything else over the course of this, this, this discussion. I have my, my things prepared that I can talk about, but as always, I'm most interested in addressing your specific questions as they come up for you. So feel free to just ask them as you have them, and I will do my best to incorporate them into this conversation. So my thought for tonight is to cover 10 little known techniques used by top scores, 10 little known strategies beyond just the content of the exam. Of course, I already have my study plans. I already have my frameworks and guidelines and such for how to go about LSAT self-study and of course, how to use the course video lessons in conjunction with the prep test and the articles on my site. But I wanted to go over 10 things that top scorers do that most people don't think about, thinking outside the box a little bit. So first thought I have in mind in number one is redoing prep tests and going beyond the numbered exams. So many students will worry about burning through material and they will kind of save up exams to do later or they will do fewer exams or they will do more exams, but either way, they worry about work, bur working through or burning through all the exams. There are currently 89 numbered exams, but there are also a handful that are unnumbered that most people don't think about. You might be aware of the June 2000 LSAT, uh, June 2007 LSAT available for free on LSAC's site. That of course is the most well-known unnumbered exam. It is between 51 and 52. But there are also the super prep exams, A, B, and C, as well as C2, that many students don't think of. There's also the February 1997 LSAT, which was never numbered, often known as the official LSAT prep test with explanations, not numbered, only available out of print and used from third-party sellers on Amazon, but you can go beyond the numbered exams. Regardless, it's incredibly important that you recognize that the value in doing the exams is not simply to measure yourself. It's to review and learn from your mistakes to avoid making them again in the future. So if you get totally obsessed with this exam, which you should, if you want a top score, that requires getting your hands on every single LSAT ever released, or at least the majority of them, and then going beyond hunting on Amazon for the third-party seller exams, where you can get more and more of them that are unnumbered and out of print, not that most people don't ever get to. So I'm putting a link in the chat here to the LSAT prep test list of every exam ever released. If you have more time on your hands than most, if you're not taking it in the next couple of months, you may want to dig down and find those unreleased exam or those out of print exams. It's useful to redo these exams, not just about measuring yourself. Number two is reviewing in depth using what I call the Socratic review method. So the default option that most students take is what I call the obsessive practice exam narrative, where you take exam after exam after exam, you measure your results, you're happier, sad about them, and you move on. That's, that's what I did, and that's where I started. Back when I was studying for this exam, back in 2005, I took an exam, and I got a 152. And that was incredibly discouraging for me because I had high hopes of getting into a top 14 law school. I'd gone to an Ivy League undergrad. I always thought I was good at tests. But the LSAT was just this one exam that I could not crack. So I was doing exam after exam after exam, and my scores stayed in the low 150s for months. And what really changed the game for me is when I started looking more deeply at my mistakes. I started analyzing them in more depth, and I pioneered what I now call the Socratic review method. I've evolved it over the years. I've innovated it, but the idea is that you're engaging in this Socratic dialogue or inquiry with yourself, where you're looking to get to the root of what gave you trouble about a problem. So taking logical reasoning, for example, what caused you to have trouble with it? What led to your mistakes? Was it an issue with the stimulus? Was it the question stem? Or was it the choices? If it was the stimulus, what about it gave you trouble? 
Was it the method of reasoning? Was it unfamiliar to you? Was it an issue with them using complex language or vocabulary or topics? Was it them using annoying conditional indicators like un unless, except, until, or without that don't neatly fit within the sufficient indicator list or the necessary indicator list? Were they requiring lots of conditional statements to be linked together? Were they requiring that you use the contrapositive? Were they failing to include evidence and conclusion indicator words? Or were they burying the conclusion in the middle? There's lots of little things they can do that will make it tougher to parse or navigate the dense text of the stimulus. But slowing down and figuring out what unique tricks and traps you are uniquely prone to falling for can help you avoid making those same mistakes in the future. If your mistake comes from the question stem, was it unfamiliar or difficult wording to refer to a common question type? You'll see oftentimes in exams in the 50s, 60s, and up, they refer to flaw questions using unique phrases. They're not simply saying flaw. They're not simply saying vulnerable to criticism. They're breaking out their th thesaurus and using less conventional ways to refer to common question types. So figuring out what's giving you trouble there can often pave the way. And finally, the answer choices. You want to look at what was tempting about the wrong answer that made you pick it and what ultimately makes it wrong and what was discouraging about the right answer that pushed you away from it that made it seem unappealing and what makes it correct in the end. This takes time. It takes a lot of time and it's not always fun to harp and focus on your mistakes. It's much easier to just take another exam and measure yourself, score it, see your number, track it, and move on to the next exam. I would rather you do fewer exams and review them in more depth because that's how you learn from your mistakes and avoid making them again going forward. This exam is a test of pattern recognition. And part of the pattern is figuring out what those methods of reasoning are, but the patterns also extend to the tricks that LSAC uses in constructing really tempting wrong answers and really discouraging right answers. And so this process, you have to go beyond just looking at the correct answer, saying, oh, how could I have been so dumb and moving on? What you really want to do is actually write this out, articulate it, talk it out. And you could also meet with a friend or a coach or a tutor or a study buddy or a study group, but talking it out with somebody or at least writing it out is a good way to force yourself to make sure that you really are getting to the root of your problems so that you can avoid making the same mistakes going forward. And students don't spend enough time on this, but I would want you to spend ideally at least three hours reviewing your results from one exam. Because if you think about it, let's say you got 15 questions wrong. You might have also had difficulty with another 10 to 15 questions, but guessed and got them right. So that could be 25, 30 questions or more that you've got to review. And if you were only spending two minutes per question on 30 questions, that's one hour of review. But two minutes a question, that's barely more time than, than you have on exam day itself under times conditions. And as we know, the exam is very strictly time. So it's worth spending at least five minutes or 10 minutes reviewing a single question. And that could be writing it out, talking it out, watching a video explanation, reading a written explanation to really get to the root of what your problem was. And you can read or watch explanations from multiple sources. Obviously, I have my written explanations. I have my video explanations, but there are also other ones out there too. If you just Google the question, you may get new insights into how other people are explaining things. I wouldn't use them as a crutch either though. I would start by looking at your own thought process first and talking it out first or writing it out first and really struggling with, struggling with the question on your own. But if it would serve you to look at other sources or my sources, by all means, go ahead. Number three, logic games. Looking at less common types that actually come up quite a bit because you have ordering games, grouping games, combination games. If you've looked, looked at games at all, you're probably aware of those. But there are also weird curveball games that come up a lot. Almost every exam these days has some sort of logic game that does not fit the mold. And top scorers obsess about the exam enough that, that they actually go out and do all the weird games specifically, even though they're tougher, even though it may not be as fun because you're not going to get as many of them right, because by definition, they are unusual in some way. And so simply copying the way others do games, like putting out slots for an ordering game or drawing a T-chart for a grouping game, that won't necessarily work for a weird curveball game. Those by definition 
what they have in common is that they are unique. So what works on one may not apply to another. What you've got to do is simply recognize that you could be throwing a curveball, but the same general principles will apply as with all games, like making inferences or holding a general rule in your head and applying it consistently over the course of the game. So I have a list of weird curveball games that I will send you here in the chat so you can practice this game type specifically. Of course, this is to do only after you've really mastered the regular games, like ordering and grouping and combinations of those. But if you want to go next level, it's worth actually practicing weird games as a category in and of themselves. The other link I've put for you is about rule substitution questions, because these are a type I get asked about all the time, and they're actually easier than many other logic games questions. They only seem weird because they didn't appear until exam 57, which was in 2009, and because you only see them approximately once per exam. And so they appear with just enough frequency to annoy you, but they're still infrequent enough that you may not develop a rhythm or a groove in terms of solving them. And so the way around this is to actually isolate them, divide and conquer, so to speak. So I put together a list of every single rule substitution question that has ever appeared, starting with exam 57 up to present. And you'll notice if you click that link, I actually even included exam C2 from the Super Prep 2 book because I went to all the unnumbered exams as well. I dig deep to find out all the questions that could possibly be relevant to your prep. And you may not need Super Prep 2 in general because there are enough other exams out there. But if you want to practice rule substitution questions in particular, there are only about 30 of them, give or take, ever. But 30 is enough to drill and practice and master. So practice those as a category by doing the initial setup for the game, making all the inferences, making your diagram, and then skip all the questions and just go directly to the rule substitution question in particular. Do that one question because you'll see it's like setting up a game. It's like making a main diagram and making related inferences and seeing is this equivalent or not? Does it lead to similar results or really identical results? Does it lead to a similar looking main diagram that leads to all the same inferences and is no more restrictive and no less restrictive than the original? That link has more guidance on strategies, but I wanted to highlight for you the importance of drilling these as a category because they show up so consistently. And this is one little thing, but enough little things added together actually have a big impact. And it is highly likely that you will see one of these on your exam. With regard to logical reasoning, it's typical to do logical reasoning questions by question stem type, in part because it's, e it's easy to categorize that way, and also because it's important to know exactly what they are asking you to do. What is the task at hand? Like strength, strengthen is obviously asking for something very different than must be true. But at the same time, it's not always just about the question stem type. It's also about the method of reasoning in the stimulus. But nobody ever categorizes by method of reasoning because it would require too much analysis and too much depth. And there might also be too many categories for this to even become useful. You could think about causal versus conditional versus fact sets, and maybe you could, defining them broadly, fit everything within one of those three categories. But that would be of limited usefulness. Instead, what I want you to do is simply think about logical reasoning from the perspective of the stimulus rather than only by the question stem. So in addition, think about the method of reasoning as you analyze questions. So for example, if we have an argument saying that we should eat at X restaurant because it has five stars on Yelp, we could strengthen that by strengthening the importance of reviews or the validity of reviews. We could weaken it by problematizing the reviews or saying the reviews aren't that relevant. We could also evaluate the argument by asking ourselves what would make reviews more or less reliable. Or we could set up a parallel argument not about restaurants and reviews in particular, but about popular opinion and what movie we should watch. So you could make analogies there too. So I'm taking the same general argument and looking at it from a number of different angles. You could also ask yourself, what would be sufficient to guarantee that for sufficient assumption? What would be an underlying necessary assumption? What would be a, a, a potential flaw with that argument? 
So even without the choices, we can look at the argument from many different perspectives, and that's a higher level or at least meta way to think about these questions aside from the question stem type. And that's important because after a certain, po a certain point, once you've built the foundation, it's no longer about simply question stem type. Instead, you're getting questions wrong simply because they're hard. If most of your wrong questions are in, ex in questions 16 through 22 in logical reasoning, that makes sense because those are the toughest questions in this section. But you won't notice a whole lot of trends in terms of, oh, I'm getting a highly disproportionate number of weakened questions wrong. You may simply get these wrong because they're tougher difficulty level. Logical reasoning questions, as well as all questions really on the LSAT, are rated on a difficulty scale of one to five, one being easy, five being hard. And you'll see this in the super prep book from LSAC. They put at the end of the book the question difficulty level. And you see, of course, more three, fours, and fives in the second half of logical reasoning than the first half. So at a certain point in your prep, you'll be ready to move beyond questions and stem type and simply looking to analyze the questions using that Socratic review method I outlined earlier. Now, moving on to, to reading comprehension, a couple of things. I noticed that lower scores tend to take a lot of notes and higher scores take few notes or none at all. And notes have never been less useful because of the digital LSAT and now the LSAT flex. You cannot write on the screen. You cannot take notes on the screen with your stylus. Instead, you're doing notes on scratch paper to the side. And again, for flex, you get five pages, five sheets. For the digital on tablet, you get 12 to 14 pages. So notes, you can make them and you have plenty of space to do so, but they won't be on the passage itself. Also, the flex and the digital LSAT have highlighting, highlighting and underlining tools, but they don't work that well. They're clunky. They're imprecise. What you try to select will be off a little bit. It won't cover exactly, exactly what you wanted. So I wouldn't rely on that. So top scores are taking few notes or none at all. They're also getting comfortable reading on the screen. So put your books aside. Try to get the exams in the digital format. You can get them quite easily from LSAC as part of what's called Official LSAT Prep Plus, aka Law Hub, at lawhub.lsac.org. And this gives you a, they have a subscription where you can purchase access for $99 a year exclusively from them. More than 60 exams in the digital LSAT format, which is identical to the LSAT Flex format. And so you can get used to reading all the passages on the screen. And I'll get more into that later, actually. But the one last thing I want to say on Reading Comp is you also train yourself to read quickly on the screen. And there are a couple of sites for this. One of them is Spreeder.com. I've typed that link there. And this lets you copy paste in text and display to yourself at different reading speeds. And my Reading Comp Masterclass goes into this more where I'm actually displaying it and showing you how you can display text at 300 words a minute, 400 words a minute, whatever you want, and increase the speed on yourself over time to get faster as you get more comfortable. But that's a good way to get used to reading dense text on screen because on test day, that's what you're going to be doing. Now, as for number six, I wanted to cover official LSAT prep plus top scores are simulating in the exact same format as test day. So you're not treating them all the same. You're not doing some questions on your phone, others out of a book, others out of a pamphlet, others out of a PDF. You're doing it the same way you'll do it on test day. And before I was saying PDFs were fine or even books were fine, but now that we've got digital LSAT, you might as well do it the same way you'll do it on test day. And your access is good for one year from LSAC. So assuming you're taking the LSAT in the next year, you might as well just get it now. If you're not quite ready yet, though, you could get two of them in that format for free inside your LSAC.org account. They are currently making available 71 and 73 for free, which were from about 2014 or so, still perfectly recent, still perfectly relevant. And then when you're ready to level up your exam prep, you would then purchase the access to get most of them. But you want to be simulating test day down to every single little detail. That includes the format of the exam that includes the timing. So once you're ready for timed exams, you're doing those three sections back to back, no break, and you're done for the flex. For the regular, the five section exam, you're doing three sections back to back, no break. 
then a short 10 minute break, then two more sections back to back. But you are mimicking everything as precisely as you can. For those taking the June LSAT or the July LSAT, both of which are likely to be a flex, June is definitely, of course, I would be practicing for flex while for July still considering the possibility of regular. But assuming that you're home anyway, you might as well do it at the same desk. You'll do the actual thing for flex practice on the same computer, the same device, you'll do the actual thing. And you're even simulating the warm up. So, especially for flex, since all questions are weighted the same and it's only three sections, you want to be ready to go since you know every question counts. So, before you start your timed exam, you're doing a favorite game, a favorite passage, a favorite couple of logical reasoning questions. You're doing those right before you hit start so that you're warmed up and ready to go because there's no room to get warmed up on test day given that nothing is experimental and everything counts for real. Number seven, mindfulness meditation to reduce stress and anxiety. I feel like I've said this so much that it's become almost cliche now, but it actually really does make a difference to focus your mind, to train your mind, to not wander during the exam. It's too easy to spiral into depression or anxiety when you screw something up or you flag something because you can't get it in the moment. But it's important to recognize that that's natural, that's okay, the LSAT is hard. And sometimes you will encounter a question that you're not sure of. And so recognizing that you're getting bogged down, recognizing that you're not making headway is mindful in a sense. And it requires taking a step back, zooming out and recognizing that while the LSAT as a whole is incredibly important, no one particular question will make or break you and no one particular exam day will make or break you. You could always retake. Law schools do not average multiple scores. They only take the highest. And personally, I'll flag questions too. I'll typically flag at least three or four questions in one logical reasoning section. And I'll flag them. I'll skip them. I'll come back to them later. The digital LSAT makes it, and Flex make it really easy to flag questions and see at a glance what you've done, what you haven't but I'll flag the tough ones and come back to them because I don't, I don't want to deal in the moment. It's just too hard. I'm getting bogged down, not making headway, but with a fresh look coming back later, I might have a new perspective or have at least more time to hammer away knowing that I've already knocked out everything else. So mindfulness, even just five minutes a day could have an enormous impact over time, even over the next two to, two to three weeks for the June LSAT, even over the course of a month and a half for the July LSAT and beyond. Three to five minutes a day would make a huge difference over time if you started now. So five minutes, just focusing on your breath could be enough, or you could use guided meditations or apps like Calm and Headspace and Waking Up, all incredibly useful. A lot of them are free. I, I highly recommend checking those out. Number eight, sleep, diet, and exercise. Those are too often neglected, but they're actually really important parts of being at your fullest capacity at 110% ready to go on test day. And especially if you're at home under quarantine, your schedule might be disrupted. Previous habits like exercise or even a proper sleep schedule may have gone out the window. Try to be as consistent as possible, ideally waking up early if you can, but also trusting your that you know best what works for you. But at least consistency makes a huge difference. Getting enough sleep makes a huge difference. With regard to exercise, you may not be able to go to the gym. You may not want to go out running but there's a ton you can do even just from home, even just doing body weight stuff makes a big difference because having a, a, a mind that's totally sharp also means having your body totally at, at 100% as well. So take some time to think about what that looks like for you, but don't neglect it. Number nine is about being obsessed with this exam and learning everything you possibly can about, can about it. And part of that is getting all the exams you possibly can Part of that involves reviewing in depth. Part of that involves simulating test day to every single little detail, like I said. But it also involves learning everything you can about the exam, how it's constructed, the minds of the people who created it. And there are a few resources for that. One of them is the Super Prep book, also the handbook from LSAC. Those are both actual physical books on Amazon. And they include, Super Prep includes exams, but it also includes LSAC's articulation of how they think about each section of the exam. Obviously, it's worded in a complex way. It is, after all, the test writers. They don't talk or write like ordinary people. They write with a certain degree of precision, with advanced vocabulary, but 
it's good to see how they think about this exam, even if their logic games, diagramming techniques aren't the cleanest or smoothest. But to get their perspective is extremely useful because they talk in a way that nobody else does. Another source of information about this would be my interviews with a former LSAT question writer. I actually became friends with a guy who used to write actual official LSAT questions. And I've done some written interviews with him on the LSAT blog. I've also done a couple of video discussions with him on the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast where we discussed the digital LSAT, LSAT versus GRE, what goes into training LSAT question writers, how the questions are constructed, what that whole process is like. Extremely important to see that mindset that he has, what he brings to the process, how he lays traps for students, what he thinks makes a difficult question. Obviously, for, if you're aiming for the 150s or 160s, you don't need to know this, but it's nice to have. And for the 170s, I really believe that getting inside the minds of the test makers and seeing the exam from their perspective is incredibly important. So these are some unique resources I put together in, con in conjunction with Dr. Stephen Harris, because I thought it was really important to see for you, for your benefit, what goes into making this exam. And I was curious as well, honestly. So check those out. Just search the YouTube channel, search the blog. If you can't find it, email me and I'll send you the links. Finally, number 10, and this is kind of unique to LSAT Flex in particular, choosing your exam time of day. One cool thing about the LSAT Flex is that you have a lot more flexibility regarding when you take the exam. So you can play to your strengths. If you're a morning person, you could take it at 9 a.m. If you're a night owl, you could do it at 7 p.m. or any time within that entire range. And then for the regular LSATs in person, you could choose a morning test date or an afternoon test date. Most of them are in the morning at 9 a.m., but there are a handful that are at 1 p.m. for the in-person. So assuming there is an in-person exam when in the near future, you would opt for that. But for the flex, you could choose any time between 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern time. And those of you on the West Coast, you might do 6 a.m. if you want, or you could do four, uh, down, down to 4 p.m. But those are some options there. One little hack I'll share with you for LSAT flex scheduling is that for both the May and June LSAT flex test administrations, you could actually schedule your time before ProctorU and LSAC announced that you could. This was kind of cool. You could get to jump on everybody else and choose your preferred time. The way to do this is that on the day of scheduling, the day that scheduling opens, before receiving the email from LSAC about logging in and scheduling, you can go on to ProctorU's site with the login that they had previously created for you without telling you. You log in with your LSAC account email address and the same, and then you reset the password on that account. So you go to reset password, forgot password, you activate it for your LSAC email address, and they will let you reset it and log in sometime several hours before the actual scheduling is announced. So you can go in there and choose your preferred time and your preferred day. And I typically would not choose to be the first one that day because there might be some issues potentially, especially for the mail side flex there were. But you may also, also not want to choose the last time that day because there could be a backlog with longer proctor wait times. So some things to think about there. But regardless, scheduling early, hey, if you can, why not? Now, I've got a number 11 here as a bonus. LSAC has become a lot more liberal in recent years with granting accommodations for things like extra time. There have been a number of lawsuits around this because they were too strict in, not, in failing to grant those accommodations to those who really needed them. And so since then, they've become much more liberal. If you can provide the appropriate documentation, you can get extra time on the LSAT. You could get time and a half, you could get double time. And obviously, on an exam, as strictly timed as the LSAT, every minute counts. And if you have difficulty focusing, you have issues with ADHD or ADD, you could get a doctor's note, get an evaluation, and apply to LSAC for extra time, and you'd be likely to get it if you get that confirmation from the doctor. And obviously makes a huge difference if you were previously struggling to finish the sections in 35 minutes with time and a half, you get 53 minutes per section. Obviously, this is not something to abuse, but if you think you might qualify, it's worth exploring the option because law schools will never know that you got extra time. It is not noted on your score report in part due to one of these lawsuits. They are not able to notate that at all. Law schools will treat them the same. They won't even know themselves. And so that can make a huge difference for you on an exam 
as quickly timed as the LSAT. So those are the, that's what I had planned for tonight. I saw a couple questions in the chat that I will get to, but please feel free to ask more. I'm happy to address them as I can. So Judy was asking about the August LSAT flex. How long is it likely for the August LSAT to be pushed back? Well, for the June LSAT, it was initially going to be June 8th, and they pushed it back about one week. The June LSAT flex is June 14th and June 15th primarily, so they pushed it back about a week. So I would expect, if it's similar, that the July LSAT scheduled for July 13th might be rescheduled the week of July 20th. The August LSAT is scheduled for August 29th. Maybe they'll push that back for early September. Or if they decide far enough in advance, maybe they'll schedule the exact same week, the exact same day. Who knows? But they have typically been taking a wait-and-see approach with rescheduling these LSATs because they're very hopeful to do them in person. So I don't know when they'll announce. I would hope they would do so soon so that people have more noticing and can adjust their schedules appropriately. But it's anyone's guess, really. They haven't even made a decision on July yet. And Ava's asking, if you're taking the August LSAT and, not, and you don't know whether it'll be a flex, would you focus on LR or focus on all three sections equally? Good question. I mean, I would say be ready for anything. Aim to master all the content. And so, of course, you're right that there is a difference in weighting where the regular in-person LSAT logical reasoning is half of the scored content. On LSAT flex, it's only about one-third of the scored content. And so if you're taking flex, I would say maybe do less on LR and more on the other sections, games and reading comp, since that's how they're weighted. But when you don't know, the best course of action, of course, is be ready for anything, aim to master it all. There's not much more I could say than that, really. Clark is asking, what's a solid score for the LSAT in general? That's really a matter of personal opinion. It's all relative, right? So if you want to go to a top 14 law school, then a solid score would be high 160s and above. If you're okay with a top 50 school, then 160 could be more than enough for you. It really varies on what your goals are. The median LSAT score is a 151. So anything above that, you're already doing better than, than a majority of people. But if you want significant scholarship money or to get into a top school, you probably want somewhere in the 160s at least. But it'll vary based on the medians of the schools that you're looking at. But anything above their median is to your benefit because that can get you scholarship money or that can increase your odds of getting accepted. And scholarship money is the easiest money you'll ever make. Just a few points more on the LSAT gets you $5,000, $10,000, admission to a better school. The ROI on that over the course of your entire career is enormous. I can't overstate it enough, really. It's so important that you put in time for your LSAT prep because your GPA is fairly fixed at this point, most likely, but your LSAT score, you could earn it in one day and make all the difference for your, for your admissions chances. And obviously, you're not studying for it in one day. You're doing at least two to three months, preferably five to six months in order to reach your fullest potential. But it's worth it. Even just a few points more makes a huge difference. And that's why I advocate retaking. I don't think anybody should apply to law school taking the LSAT only once because through luck alone, you could do a few points better. And law schools don't average multiple scores. They only take the highest. And so if you're aiming for, let's say, the October LSAT, you might as well take the November as well and still apply early enough in the cycle. You would. And through luck alone, you do two to three points better. Awesome. You do worse. No big deal. They only take the highest. But all you've got to do between October and November is stay fresh on the LSAT for another month. Maybe do a timed exam or two per week. And if you improve your understanding on top of staying fresh, you could do even better. And most people, on average, only improve, improve a couple of points on the LSAT, but two, three points is actually a lot. Value of one point on the LSAT could be $5,000 if you look at it from the perspective of scholarship money or getting to a better ranked school with better employment outcomes. Again, easiest money you'll ever make. Snay is asking, could you take the July LSAT and still apply for fall 2020? Yeah, you could potentially. I don't see why not. It depends on the school, whether they are still taking applications or not. It'll vary from school to school, but many schools have extended their deadlines more and more to see who else will come along, especially during this pandemic that we're in. A lot of folks are holding off on going to law school. And so schools will dig deeper into their pool of applicants. They will open up later and later applications. And really, why not? I've never understood why 
deadlines were so early for law school admissions. For business school, they're not. And if you're not starting until the fall anyway, why not take people in August off the wait list if it makes sense from the, from the school's perspective? So I would say look at the individual schools and see what your options are, but also look carefully at what your scholarship opportunities are as well, because it's not something to take lightly. And if you could get more scholarship money or get into a better school by waiting a year, you might not want to do it in the short term, but it could make sense from the long-term perspective. So I would evaluate author offers from them very carefully and remember that you are a hot commodity. They need you more than you need them, especially with all the ambiguity about whether law school will be online this fall or with extreme social distancing, but tuitions are still pretty high. So a lot of folks may not want to start law school under those conditions. You might not mind, it might work for you, you might want to do online, but it's obviously very different 1L experience for a fairly similar price. And so I would look very carefully at what your options are if you're going to start this fall and see if they're offering you enough money in scholarships or if you're going to a well enough ranked school and consider negotiating. I would actually, I would always negotiate, but consider what your other options are, whether it's waiting a year or going to a different school. Leia is asking, how many times is too much for taking the LSAT? So is there a number of retakes that's too many or a number of takes that's too many? Yeah, there is. I'd say that anything more than four takes is a little bit much. Three to four is totally fine. Five or six starts to look like you might not be choosing to take the LSAT when you're fully ready or exercising the right judgment about that. But if that's your situation, you could still be okay. Just write an addendum explaining why you took it so many times, especially with the digital LSAT last year, the flex this year as well. They are understanding that there were some format issues with all the changes that may not have worked for you or being confusing or proctoring may not have been so smooth, of course. And so they will understand, just write an addendum. And the way to avoid being in that, in that situation is really make sure you're only taking it when you feel reasonably confident that you're going to get the result that you want. And so if that requires postponing or withdrawing your, your registration, do it. If you postpone or withdraw, law schools will never even know that you were registered for that particular test date. But it is what it is. If you already took it five or six times, just write an addendum. Ultimately though, what they want is the score. They want the highest score. So I would retake if you have not yet gotten a score that you want to apply with. It's better to take it one, one more time and get a higher score than to worry about having too many takes on record and applying with a lower score. Mushan's asking, have I ever heard of a, a getting a, a waiver from, the pro, from LSAC for an under the desk footrest? That's a good question. I have not heard about that. Of course, I assume that you're referring to taking the LSAT Flex online from home. And I would, I would ask LSAC about that. I would ask them if they are okay with the footrest. I know that they say nothing under your desk, but maybe they could make an exception for that one. And then for taking it in person, I'm not sure if they would let you bring a footrest. I would say probably not because of cheating concerns somehow, but I would contact them and ask. I, I can't say much more than that. Noah's asking about the best date to take the LSAT for applying for fall, 20, fall 2021 emissions. The best date... Noah, is whenever you're ready. So if that requires delaying it, delay it. But you could take August or October or November, or even this July, if, you're, if you'll be ready in time, and still apply fairly, excuse me, fairly early in the cycle. Anything this calendar year to start law school next calendar year is perfectly early. And even taking the LSAT in January or February isn't as late as it was in the past. It's still preferable to take it earlier if you can, but better to apply, to, better to take the LSAT later and apply later with a higher score than to, than to take it earlier when you're not as ready just to apply sooner. So in other words, a 163 in November is better than a 161 in October, and a 165 in January is better than a 163 in November. So take it later, if that's what is required to get a higher score. Another question on how many practice tests is roughly a good number before taking the actual? Great question. So I would recommend taking at least 10 full length timed exams before test day, ideally. 10 dry run throughs. 
And for the flex, that's pretty easy because it's three sections, not five. Relatively easier to complete 10 of those than 10 five section exams. But either way, I would aim to do at least 10. If you're taking the LSAT in two and a half weeks for June, don't try to necessarily fit in all 10. You could do five and that would be enough. But if you're taking the LSAT in a, at least a month or two from now, 10 is doable doing maybe two or, two or three a week on average. I'd say more likely to do two a week, five section exams, and then maybe three a week, three section exams, because three section exams are less taxing than five section exams are. But I, I would aim to do at least 10 so that it really becomes like second nature to you. That becomes rote to do an exam and dealing with the endurance and the pacing, and then of course, reviewing it afterwards. I would, never, I would never do more than three exams in a week though, because you don't want to burn out. And you also wouldn't have enough time to review them in sufficient depth. But two to three a week, totally fine. My rule for this is maximum three exams per week and minimum three hours reviewing each exam. And you're simulating these as fully as possible, meaning strict timing, no breaks, you're not getting up for the bathroom unless it's, it's on the clock. And for the flex, you're not even allowed to get up to go to the bathroom. There are some proctors who have not enforced that rule strictly, but you never know what you're going to get. So I would, I would prepare for the flex that you're not getting up at all, period. You're not leaving the field of view of the camera at all, period. Obviously for extra time situations, they make exceptions there, but for the regular 35 minute section exam, you're not getting up at all, period, for the flex. A follow up about the flex here. For the July LSAT, three sections or four sections. I would do three sections because that's what you'll do on test day. You could do the occasional four section exam to push your endurance a little bit. And if you're not sure what you're going to get, I would do a handful of three sections and a handful of five sections exams just to properly simulate either option because you don't know what you're going to get. Well, if nothing else, I'm going to leave off here for now. I'll again remind you all to keep up with all the latest changes regarding the LSAT Flex. Again, here's the link to the FAQ. And obviously, of course, I have many more lessons on the Flex in the course to check out with dealing with the recent changes, how to navigate them, all the details and such. Please feel free to reach out if you need anything at all going forward. If you need a, a particular study plan, let me know. If you have questions, let me know. Happy to help. And I'll see you all soon. Be well and good night, everyone. Thanks for all the great questions. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.